the uh, ceremony. Len is the editor and the publisher of MarylandReporter.com. He's formerly State House Bureau Chief of the uh, Daily Baltimore Examiner. Uh, and but uh, MarylandReporter.com is something that uh, you should all probably be interested in. You can go online, uh, get into MarylandReporter.com, and it's pro probably uh, the best daily summary of what is going on, now, not only here in Annapolis at the legislature, but uh, in Maryland, and it's accessible to everybody. Matt, how much you take up the program? Thank you, Lou, for the plug. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, the Speaker of the House has uh, things in common with you. Uh, his, his gray hair. Uh, the, uh, like much of the leadership in the, the uh, House of Delegates, uh, three of the committee ch chairs are senior citizens. You're almost a senior citizen, right, Mr. Speaker? I think 65 qualifies. Oh, okay. He's 65. So what, so what, what should this group of senior citizens take away from uh, this year's budget in terms of how it will impact them? The, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and it's great that everyone stays engaged in the governmental process. I think the most important thing is that each and everyone come down here today, uh, make contact with your individual legislator, know what your individual, let that legislator know what your individual concerns are, uh, and they might be many and varied. But it's important because uh, this is a participatory activity. You have to uh, participate and make sure your legislators know exactly what you want for a representative democracy. Now, the question in hand was the uh, budget uh, that is before us and what concerns there might be out there. First and foremost, uh, the state of Maryland, like every other state, has to balance the budget. So at the end of the day, we have to balance our budget. Uh, and we try to keep a certain amount of the savings account for the rainy day fund, which guarantees us a AAA bond rating, which gives us a low interest rate for one of nine states, I believe, right now, that still have a AAA bond rating in this country, which means you're considered fiscally sound by the rating agencies um, in New York City. This year budget is a challenge, it's $1.1 billion deficit. Uh, last year, uh, we went through the tough decisions of asking state employees to pay more for their pension program, a 5% to 7% contribution. We asked uh, retirees to pay uh, higher co-pays for the prescription drugs. Uh, and we made those determinations because we had to get our fiscal liability for pension, pension liability in, in order. We saved the state about $100 million on a year-to-year -year basis, but we put ourselves in line with uh, the recommendations that uh, the bonding agencies uh, had with the association known as uh, GAD. But uh, this year's budget, uh, we're trying to protect, first and foremost, uh, the education dollars in local aid, we have a $15 billion general fund budget, 15 billion. 6.5 billion goes directly to local government. Uh, 5.8 billion of that is K-12 education. Uh, as you know, we have been ranked number one in the country four years in a row for our K-12 education system. Uh, why is that important? Because in recessionary time, USA Today had an article that those with college degree are uh, unemployment uh, rate in this country is 5%, those with a high school degree is 10%, and those with neither is 15%. One of the reasons that Maryland's unemployment rate is two points below the national average is because we have a well-educated workforce. And we depend on a research-based economy. So we invest a lot of money in education. We invest $1.5 billion into our colleges and our university systems. We have great public universities. The University of Maryland is one of the finest uh, research public universities in the country today. And you have Johns Hopkins University as one of the finest private research universities in the country today. You put $3.5 billion into Medicaid. What does that pay for? That pays for nursing home reimbursement, pays for hospital costs, 
pays physicians who provide Medicaid. Uh, the patients who can't afford health care. Many seniors are not on Medicare, but Medicaid eligible. So when uh, we talk about Medicaid dollars of $3.5 billion, as our half of $3.5 billion comes from the federal government, 80% of those dollars go to senior citizens, developing disabled, and uh, mentally uh, challenged individuals. Almost uh, 80 to 90 percent of the people in uh, a lot of our nursing homes are Medicaid funded because people have to spend down to qualify for Medicaid before being in nursing homes. So the vast majority of that money goes in that direction. We try to protect that money in the budget. So one of our goals is to protect that 3.5 billion. So if you're counting at home, 6.5 the local government, 3.5 the Medicaid. That's 10 billion dollars of a 15 billion dollar budget. Uh, we put 1.5 in the higher end, that is 11, uh, 5 out of 15 billion, put 1.2 billion in corrections. You have prisons, you have uh, prison guards, you have public safety, you have your EMS and medical services, you have the best shock trauma system in the country, that's all paid for through the general fund budget uh, in that area. So the other portion pays for your salaries, your benefits, your health care for your state employees. Right now, uh, per capita, our, our uh, state employees are the, are the lowest per capita since 1973. Uh, when the budget projections were made at the end of the previous governor's uh, term, uh, our projections were we would be at an $18 billion budget today. We're only at $15 billion. That's mainly because of the recessionary period which took place on Wall Street. But we tried to protect senior citizen programs, developing disabled, uh, as well as uh, fully fund our education system. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Delegate O'Donnell, would you like to talk about this year's budget and its impact on these folks out in the audience? Sure, I would. And first of all, let me say thank you for inviting me today. Uh, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And, and we know that you have meetings with your delegations and senators uh, across the day. And uh, I will tell you that you are a very important group of citizens of this state and the entire General Assembly takes your presence here very, very seriously. Uh, and that's why the speaker and I wanted to come and talk to you this morning. Um, I have uh, uh, somewhat, obviously, of a different perspective uh, on things, and so I'd like to share that with you with regard to the budget. Uh, it's true that we have a lot of good things going for us in this state. Absolutely true. Uh, what we can't do is overextend ourselves to the point that we threaten everything. And we, we should also endeavor to do no harm in our budget. And, and I think that we're on the verge of doing some of that. Um, and so we need to tighten our belt a little bit to make sure we don't go too far down that path and hurt you and hurt other citizens of this state and jeopardize our priorities uh, for the future. One of the things that I think puts uh, seniors at particular risk is uh, the fact that many seniors are on fixed incomes. Many seniors, I know my own mother, uh, who was retired prior to her passing, uh, lived on Social Security. Her, her expenses were not fixed, but her income was. And it made it very difficult, you know, when, when prices increased, when real estate taxes went up, when the cost of food or gas or medicines went up. And we should make sure at the state level that we're not spending too much so that we put those kind of pressures on some seniors who are struggling to get by on the income. We're borrowing a lot of money right now in our capital budget, and that's fine. We, we should probably have a healthy program, but we got to make sure we don't overextend ourselves. We're bumping up against uh, our borrowing limitations with regard to building capital infrastructure in the state. So, uh, what does that mean? Our state constitution requires the property tax to cover the debt service on those monies that we're borrowing. If we don't have enough revenues coming in from the state property tax, we have to do one of two things. We have to spend more money out of the general fund to pay that debt service, or we have to raise your property tax. Raising property tax from seniors on fixed income is harmful, obviously, uh, to many who are struggling to make ends meet. So we have to be careful we're not spending too much money in our capital budget. And we, we are projected to have to raise 
several hundred million dollars over the next two years just to cover the debt service of the monies we're borrowing right now. Additionally, uh, we're looking at revenue uh, streams right now this, in this coming budget that could hurt you. I'm talking about a gas tax, talking about a flush tax, talking about vehicle registration fee increases, talking about a sales tax increase, talking about uh, uh, many other things that could be very regressive and very detrimental to your fixed income. And as seniors, you have to be careful. Now, some seniors have, have planned well. Some seniors can handle it. Many of you are probably in that, but others are going to struggle. And when that gas tax goes up, it drives the food cost up. And when the food cost goes up, and the flush tax goes up, and the sales tax goes up, and all these fees and taxes continue to go up, you're going to struggle to pay it. So part of our job, part of my job, is to temper our zeal to continue to spend money. The state's budget is not $15 billion. The state's budget is $35.8 billion. The operating, uh, excuse me, the general fund, which is only one part of the budget, is $15 billion. But the state's operating budget that we're going to vote on here in a couple months is $35.8 billion. Additionally, we have $18 billion of unfunded liabilities in our state retiree pension system. And we have $10 billion of unfunded liabilities in retiree health care benefits. So we have a lot of obligations that are out there. We need to temper things down. There's a, there's a lot of taxes included in this budget that are going to hurt people and stifle our economy. And we're going to endeavor to reduce that spending. I think a lot of the, my colleagues, by the way, on the other side of the aisle, agree with tempering some of this stuff and not raising incomes on people, for instance, uh, income taxes and removing deductions on people as far down as $100,000 a year income. So Mr. Speaker, in his head, uh, head of the uh, overwhelming Democratic majority in the House of Delegates, what is your point of view? What, Which of these proposed taxes do you think you're going to be able to get through? Well, well, first and foremost, uh, I'll start with the budget and then, uh, just as a clarification, uh, our general fund budget is $15 billion. Uh, that's what we work off of. $35 billion that the minority leader is talking about is money that we get from the federal government, money goes to the Transportation Trust Fund. That is not part of the money that we deal with balancing our budget. Our budget is balanced off our income tax, which you pay, it's pet, on the sales tax, corporate taxes, the alcohol tax, uh, lottery and gaming revenues. Uh, but the other money is money that you are taxed at the federal level, comes back to the transportation on the $10 billion, comes back from the federal government. I don't know that anybody wants to uh, leave that off the table. Uh, our, our overall budget does grow over year. That's because our, our population grows. We are a state of uh, 5.8 million people uh, today. But our general fund budget, where we talk about balancing our budget, and the programs that the state directly provides to counties and, and programs is $15 billion. We're not shifting the money around from the federal government that comes back to us. That's that match for Medicaid. So I just want to make a clarification there. What we are is about $1.1 billion short of the $15 billion. So the governor brings in his budget. It's a proposal. And then it's to be fine-tuned by the General Assembly. There'll be a debate on both sides of the aisle. Uh, a lot of breakdown in the geographic areas as well about where there should be cuts and where there should be revenues. The governor proposed 16, uh, or 6 .1, or 60, $615 million worth of uh, revenue uh, cuts and shift. One is to send the teacher pension money back to uh, the county, so counties can share in the pension liability for teachers. Currently, uh, the state picks up the entire pension cost for teachers, which is about a billion dollars a year. Salaries for teachers are set at the local level. The question is, should there be some kind of uh, collaborative effort on that liability? Should locals who raise the salaries have some of the responsible liability for uh, pensions that are paid. So he suggested that two, two, $240 million go back to the counties. He suggested that uh, some of the Medicaid programs uh, and the cost at the hospitals uh, should be absorbed. We have an all-payer system. 
Uh, that takes care of most of the $615 million. That's $404 million worth of revenues. A uh, large portion of that is to limit exemptions. In other words, if you make $100,000, uh, he's asking you that you only get 90% of your exemptions, your charitable contributions, your mortgage, things of that nature. Make $200,000, they can ask you to get 80% of those exemptions. Uh, that not only helps the state budget, but also uh, provides about $110 million uh, in uh, aid to uh, local subdivisions to help offset the cost of the pension ship. So that's what the governor has in his budget, plus he has a uh, $20 million tax over loose tobacco, which is uh, premium cigars, uh, chew, uh, if you put a something between your cheek and gum, I guess the boss will go up for that, uh, as well as where cigarettes are. Online sales uh, would uh, raise about 20, tax and online sales, the same as sales tax would go up to about $21 million. Uh, and there's a $50 million uh, one-time contribution uh, from the injured workers insurance fund uh, for them to gain uh, independence as an insurance company. Uh, that is part of the equation. But that's the governor's proposal. Now, over the next 80 days, it's our job to fine tune that. Our job as leaders, both in the Democrat and Republican Party, come up with ideas. If you don't like those, come up with other ideas. That's our job. That's why they sent us here. But at the end of that 90 day period of time, unlike the federal government, we have to balance the budget. We have to find $1.1 billion in either cuts or revenues to balance the budget. Now, as I gave you uh, the category, 6.5 billion goes to local government. We cut local education, we cut the libraries, we cut police aid, we cut community college. 1.5 billion goes to higher education. We cut higher education and raise tuition. Right now, the state of Virginia is raising tuition costs. All the public universities, Pennsylvania cut higher ed 20 percent. More, fewer and fewer kids can afford to go to college. The other is Medicaid, $3.5 billion of Medicaid. Are we doing that? Are going to take people say that they no longer qualify for health care? Not going to let you go into nursing homes? Close down nursing homes? Are going to do that? I don't think so. And then the other is corrections, $1.2 million. I mean, other states have decided that they're letting the prisoners out of prison. California, they're letting them out. I don't think we want to do that in the state of America. So it comes down to where do you find the cuts? Last year we asked state employees to pay more money. The average state employee makes $45,000 a year. That's median income. The average median income in the state of Maryland is $69,000 a year. We have the highest median income of any state in the union. A state trooper today starts at $39,000 a year. We're not, we're not staying in line to get those jobs. $39,000. Hard to make them. So I don't think we're going to cut state workforce any further. So we either have to come up with further cuts in those categories, or we have to come up with revenues. In my estimation, at the end of the day, there'll be a combination of both. But what about the governor's proposals? Are there any elements of them that, that any part of them that you're going to have difficulty passing in the House? I think everything's going to be difficult. Right. Tony, Tony, what's your set? Delegate O'Donnell, what's your assessment of uh, which of these tax increases might have a chance of passing, or all? Yeah, well, I, I, I suspect that all of them have a chance of passing, uh, but it's a matter of uh, which one should pass and, and how much uh, people are willing to buck the system around here and say, no, this doesn't make sense for my citizens. I know some people who are willing to buck the system. Who are willing to stand up for power and say, hey, I have my say too. But it's a matter of how many of them. Um, look, the reality is our budget is $35.8 billion. And it's comprised of a lot of different things. The general funds, special funds, federal funds, they all come together and they make our budget. And sometimes we take money from pot A and stick it into pot B. For instance, we take money from the transportation trust fund and stick it in the general fund. We take money from the money from the transfer tax and on real estate in the state that used to be 
use to pay for program open space and we shove it into the general fund. But those monies are fungible. The state treasurer's here and she knows that. That money moves across those pots, general fund, special fund, federal funds. But in the end, in the end, ladies and gentlemen, it's all taxpayer dollars. We can categorize it any way we want, which pot it is, which pot it isn't. But Senator Muse and Speaker Bush and myself, when we vote, when we vote on the state's budget, we don't vote on the general fund and have a separate vote on the federal funds and separate vote on the special funds. We vote on the state's budget. There's one bill. It's negotiated. It's submitted by the governor. It's negotiated between the Senate and the House, and we pass the entire bill. And that thing has been 20, it started out six years ago at $28 billion. Then it went up a billion to 29. Then it went up a billion and a half to 31. So, right? The budget that was submitted by the governor the other day is $35.8 billion. And that's all our funding, all the state's operating costs. It's not bricks and mortars, it's not our capital budget, but it's the operating budget of the state, and it's all taxpayer dollars. And we have to be careful that we're not overspending for the future. And that's what I submit that we are. Now, in terms of uh, these taxes, we can talk about which ones are going to pass, but i got to tell you, we're in a down economy. And if we continue to spend the way we've been spending, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know you're going to be hurt. And so, are, so is the state in the long run. The federal government's going to retrench. It cannot sustain the debt that's accumulating there. Go to usdebtclock.org. Take a look at the national debt. It's $16 trillion, and there's no throttle. They're accumulating that national debt. That clock is ringing up so fast it makes my head spin. And I'm not pointing the finger because all, all parties have been a part of this. What I'm saying is our country's future is at stake. We can't continue to 